All right, let's get started. We should have a, a few more people trickling in as we get started, but I want to welcome everyone to what we're calling Genesis Month uh, with the MIT Bitcoin Club and the Sloan Blockchain Club. My name is Gabriel Pasquale, and I'm co-president of the Sloan Blockchain Club. Woo. Woo. So a few administrative items before we get started. Uh, number one, this uh, workshop and the, the following two workshops will be live streamed and recorded. So if you're not comfortable being recorded, you're happy to, or you're more than welcome to follow along with the workshop on the live stream. Um, there's a Q&A system built into the live stream, which I'll uh, keep an eye on. Uh, yeah, let's see here. Let me pull it up. I will throw it into our, ah, speaking of, I'll throw it into the WhatsApp group here. So everyone, if you get a chance, please scan that code and join the WhatsApp. Perfect. And then I just put the live stream link in there. And um, if someone would, wouldn't mind bumping that every so often. Perfect. Um, so just so everyone's aware, this is the first of three workshops. So we have Steve coming back next Tuesday at 8 PM in the same room and the Tuesday after that. And each workshop builds on the previous one. So uh, if you happen to, to miss one, you're more than welcome to follow along in the recording and then catch us on, on the third one. Um, and then the final uh, actually announcement for the MIT Bitcoin Club. So we have the uh, MIT Bitcoin Club. Um, every year, the MIT Bitcoin Club plans a conference called the MIT Bitcoin Expo. And we're putting together the committee to plan this conference. The conference is the largest student-run crypto um, event, which holds uh, the conference side as well as a hackathon and pitch contest. And we're looking for, for leadership to plan the event. So if you're interested in joining that leadership team, please DM me. You can find my contact through, through this WhatsApp group. We're going to have a selection meeting for the director of the expo, along with chairs, next Monday night. So if you're interested, please shoot me a message and we can, we can chat. Um, so just a few notes. Um, we had a few conversations this summer. Uh, we have the other co-president of the Sloan Blockchain Club, Sam. We have the president of the Bitcoin Club, Vlada, up here. And we had a few chats this summer on what would be the best way to both get our community excited about decentralized te technologies at the beginning of the year, um, and then also provide them, a, I guess our community here, a roadmap on what to research and, and learn about throughout the year. Um, and so I was fortunate to meet Steve at the MIT Bitcoin Expo uh, this past May, and he mentioned that he teaches three practical workshops, which I was incredibly excited about. And within each of these workshops, uh, they use components of Web3 that we all want and, and, and need to learn about. So Steve went to undergrad at MIT. Uh, he studied mechanical engineering. And then he came back and did an MBA at Sloan. And so what better a person <laughs> to teach the MIT Bitcoin Club and the Sloan Blockchain Club than Steve. Um, so please, uh, let's welcome Steve up to the stage, and we'll get started with the workshop. Hello, is this working? Is that on? You can take that. All right. Well, thank you so much. And I was thinking exactly the same thing, uh, you know, having an undergraduate here and having a, a course two and 15 degrees. It, uh, it's a great honor to be at this sort of combined event. When I was here as a Sloan, um, Sloaney, I was looking at the MIT Bitcoin Club and I thought, why aren't we doing more of this across campus? And then. If you know MIT, you know that everybody does their own little thing in separate places. So hats off to the leadership of the two teams to pull something together like this. So um, as Gabrielle mentioned, we're going to do three workshops. Um, uh, this is actually taught for, or brought from uh, 14 different classes that I've, I've taught over semesters over the past several years um, to bring, bring kind of uh, MBAs and, and people who don't have any crypto experience into the world of Web3 just to get kind of an appreciation for what's, what's happening and then be able to really use the tools and, and leverage them. So uh, 
My background, we mentioned the, the degrees, my, my uh, crypto experience is uh, I've done a bunch of stuff in tokenomics, I've consulted for a bunch of companies, and I'm currently founder of HashChat, which is a wallet-to-wallet -wallet messaging app, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a little bit. Um, and I also consult for multinational organizations. This is like the small bit, because I only didn't want to take up too much time on this part, but um, anyways. But uh, I should say my, my whole career has been around translating technology for business applications. So when I got to the point of looking at Bitcoin and kind of looking at blockchain and how that works and evaluating it from a technology perspective, I thought, this stuff is incredible. And if you look at technologies from an innovative lens, an innovation lens, there's certain technologies that are incremental innovations that just simply move the needle a little bit. And there's a ton of businesses that'll pick up those incremental technologies all day long and just say, yeah, that's great. It can save costs. And blockchain, sort of broadly speaking, can save costs to a lot for a lot of different applications. And it's been deployed all over the place. But that is not, for me personally, that is not all that interesting. I really want those disruptive and radical components of the innovation, and that is in the decentralization aspect of it. So, so one of the themes that you'll see throughout this whole thing is that the decentralized aspect of blockchains, broadly speaking, um, is really a transformative, powerful um, effect. And it's really hard to parse out when that's important and not, and hopefully some of these tools you'll learn through these three workshops will help you kind of apply that and see, see where they go. Okay. So, uh, I want to start with some, some landscape pictures just to kind of position us. Um, and you guys are probably too young to remember when the internet was born. But when the internet was born, it was, you know, information needs to be free, right? Set information free. Everybody needs to have access to information. Um, but what was missing from that internet, inter, inter, you know, information is free everywhere is where did it come from and who owns it? You know, like I, still today I, you get these JPEGs and memes. I have no idea where they came from or who, who actually, you know, controls those things. And that, that's how it is right now, right? If you can just get information all over the place, you get information overload. In fact, I believe someone said uh, the reason why we have an advertising business model is because we don't have a good financial infrastructure for the internet today. So, you know, enter, enter the blockchain, which adds uh, a wonderful uniqueness factor and adds an ownership and control factor to the internet. By the way, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of ways of thinking about blockchain. So this is just one of them. So by the time I'm done with this, if you still don't understand what blockchain is, please ask the questions. But there's a lot of different lenses to look at this from. It's one of the reasons why I love this, love this space. So blockchain provides an ability to, to create a unique asset on the internet and to describe and to claim ownership of it, and to prove ownership of it anonymously to anyone across the world in a matter of minutes. That's, I mean, to me, that's like amazing right there, so. Um, but of course, if you have a internet of value, you have these gigantic crypto rails uh, that I can move digital assets around. What's the most interesting asset that I want to move around? Of course, it's money. So you add cryptocurrency on top of blockchains and you get this internet of money. So. A lot of you are probably thinking, this is the MIT Bitcoin Club and the Sloan Blockchain Club. What is the difference between Bitcoin and blockchain? Basically, Bitcoin was the first blockchain. I'm sure that people probably theoretically invent, you know, thought of blockchains before, but when Bitcoin came along, it kind of invented blockchain and it became a big deal. So if you have a conversation with people and they're like, use Bitcoin and blockchain together all the time, that's one of the reasons why, because they're sort of invented together. And then Ethereum came along, so, okay. But I'm still stuck with what is blockchain? And when I first heard the phrase blockchain, this is what I saw. I hope you guys all saw this too, like a bunch of blocks that are chained together. Each block is a whole bunch of transactions, and a transaction is something like you and me, I'm sending you money, digital money or I'm buying an NFT asset. That's all blocked into one section, and then for the cryptographers in the audience, it's hashed. And for the business people in the audience, it's like a fingerprint of all those transactions, and that hash is then chained to the next block. So what you have, and what's shown here, the green is the Genesis block, maybe it's you know, akin to your Genesis month. Um, once you start the blockchain and you continue to add these blocks onto it over and over and over again, you get this continual growth of security that's, that's confirmed and locked in every time. So the longer the chain is, the more secure it is. Bitcoin has been going since 2009. Ethereum has been going since 2013. These are very long chains. So to change something way back here and to 
to decide that I want to get out of a transaction is virtually impossible. I would have to bribe a whole bunch of different people. So that's another lens of what is blockchain. But what is, you know, then people come to me and they say, well, what is blockchain? What, what, what is it? And it's like, well, here, this is 11,000 computers stuck in people's closets all over the globe that are confirming the Bitcoin blockchain. Every, every 10 minutes, all the transactions are getting confirmed. And sometimes that's a better view of what is blockchain. It's like, okay, it's a bunch of computers sitting in people's houses. But what's powerful about this image is that they're all running their own independent code and they're all over the globe and there's no borders involved in any of these transactions. So that's, that's one of the kind of, you, you don't really see it because it's just a map with a whole bunch of blobs on it. But what you realize is they're all running the same thing but they all are in different jurisdictions but they're operating under the same set of code rules. So you've got different laws and nations and geographies, but all of a sudden in the internet you have your own kind of area of, of law and area of, of work that you can operate under. It's a pretty profound and powerful concept. So this is a pretty old image too, sorry, that's from 2021. But what does Ethereum look like? This is Ethereum, it's roughly the same thing. 10,000 nodes all strewn across. Sorry, South America. I think there's some nodes down there, but I'm sure there's some people from South America here, but. <laughs> <clears throat> So that's another view of what is blockchain, what, what are they, and what, what's happening here. Um, another view is, and if you guys want to go to your laptops and go to Text Street, um, I can show you a live image view of what is on blockchain. Let's see here. So you can just, oops, wrong one. Where did it go? There it is. So this is, this is the live view of transactions that are being queued up to be locked into a block. And, and I love the people at Text Street, if you're, if you're watching this now, you're, you guys are the greatest. Um, why did they pick South Park characters for little transactions? I don't know, but it's just genius, right? So those, tra those, little, pe those little people could be you, um, and, and the left side, what you're seeing is the applications that are generating those transactions. And then what's happening is they're getting queued up and there's, a, there's something called gas costs or a fee for every transaction. So they're getting, they're getting ordered by who's willing to pay more for the gas cost so they get priority. And then what's on the right-hand side is a, what looks like a bus but it's actually a block and it's getting um, locked into the chain then. So each one of those transactions come along and then it moves on to the blockchain. So That is yet another view of what is blockchain? Okay, this is it actually happening in real time. And you can play around with this site and you can look at um, what does it look like next to um, uh, Bitcoin. So you can look at Ethereum's blockchain and Bitcoin's blockchain right next to each other, which is interesting to see kind of, you know, it's operating faster here. Um, and there is a big merge coming up. How many people have heard of the merge? Oh, everybody, all right, good, good. Um, and that hopefully should make the left-hand side go even faster, but we'll see. Question. It's the merge. Ah, okay, so, so we haven't talked about the consensus layer yet of blockchain, um, but what's happening for each one of these buses that's coming along is it's getting sent over to the miners, and these miners are, are basically consuming a lot of electricity and computational horsepower to find the key to each one of the blocks to lock it into the chain. And that proof, it's called proof of work, which just basically means whoever has the most horse, computational horsepower wins and can win the fees from that block. Uh, and Ethereum has been working for about two years to figure out how to convert it to proof of stake, which, which basically means instead of spending a lot of money on electricity and computer hardware, I just put a whole bunch of effectively dollars in cryptocurrency up against each node and say, this is a valid transaction. So it's a heck of a lot more energy efficient and a lot cleaner and can also lead to a lot faster and a lot better um, operations. Uh, that merge that's been in the works for two years, that's been tested I think on 13 different test nets, is scheduled to take place sometime tomorrow night around midnight. But it, may cha it changes on a, on a moment by moment basis because of the, excuse me, the miners that are currently doing all the hard work they're about to be out of a job once that happens. So it'll be very interesting to watch what happens tomorrow night. So anyways, that's the merge. <laughs> Do you think graphics card prices will go down? 
most of the mining is now done in uh, dedicated hardware. So it used to be that graphics card would, they would fly off the shelf because you could basically make money and pay for the graphics card in a matter of hours in your dorm room, but not anymore. So, so that's, a, that's another view of what, uh, what uh, blockchain, blockchain looks like and what it is. Any other questions? Okay. So I want to just go back to this view again. This is kind of a stacked view. So you've got internet, blockchain, and uh, cryptocurrency. But if we, if we dive a little bit deeper into that, what you have is a more complex landscape of, of what's going on. And I've got this kind of, with a tech stack, at the bottom not shown as the internet. This is the blockchain layer. And then you've got protocol layers. And then you have where the interesting stuff happens up, up higher. Um, uh, and I also have, from left to right, it's sort of chronological. So you've got Bitcoin came out first, and then Ethereum came out second. Does it work if I use my mouse? Can you guys see that, or should I? Yeah, OK, all right. So uh, for Bitcoin, you've got the public Bitcoin blockchain. And I wanted to make a distinction between that and private blockchains. I'm not going to talk about private blockchains. Just wanted you to know that they exist, and that companies use the technology of blockchains and just bring it in-house minimizes a lot of the potential value in terms of decentralization because it's highly centralized, but they exist. Um, so Bitcoin is a public blockchain. Anyone can get access to it. Anyone can get an address on it. Um, and on top of the, uh, the blockchain itself, and at this bottom layer is things where consensus happens and where um, validation happens. And if you're, a, if you're a hardcore computer science nerd, this is probably where you want to spend your time geeking out on blockchains. Um, it's where a lot of the conversations and a lot of the work started. Um, if you're more kind of want to use blockchain, you want to do financial derivatives and stuff, you'd want to move further up this, this stack and kind of integrate with the, with the blockchain through different application layers. Um, built on top of the blockchain are the protocols for both Bitcoin and Ethereum. And then on top of those, oops, go away. Oh, jump there. Okay. Um, on top of those, uh, there is a smart contract layer. I call it a bot contract because the phrase smart contract drives me crazy. In fact, when I first got introduced to blockchain, someone said, oh, it's great. They, they, they're smart contracts. And I, don't, I mean, being a programmer by background, I was like, I, I don't, that doesn't, it sounds like I'm getting sold something. And it wasn't until somebody said, no, 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 it's programmable money. And then all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute, that's cool. I can take my assets, I can take my investments, and I can move them around programmatically and hunt for the best yields and do all kinds of that. Now that I'm into. So that was, that was 2016, and I haven't looked back. So, um, Yeah, so then on top of the smart contracts, you have currencies, uh, and then you have a wallet. So if you think about humans come in the top, right, and then machines are at the bottom here. Um, where we're going to spend most of our time in the next three days, or the next three classes, is in this box. So Ethereum has its currency, um, and then it has smart contracts, but then you also build dApps on top of the smart contracts, and you can do your own custom tokens, and you can mint your own NFTs on top of Ethereum, um, and then you, you have a wallet. And today we're going we're gonna to get everybody a wallet and figure out how to, how to get on and interact with all this stuff. But I wanted you to have this image in your head about where where things are sitting. So when you're when you're sitting there with your wallet on your web interface, you're like, why? You know, where am I in the in the landscape of all these things? And this is where you are. Um, I should mention that CryptoKitties is the first NFT. In fact, they invented the standard of ERC721, which became NFTs. So I'm sure you all know what NFTs are. We don't have to go into a lot of details on them, but you can mint them on the Ethereum blockchain. And then finally, to the far right, I've got some of the altcoins and some of the other ones. I do not. By the way, I've, I've taught this class a number, for a number of years, and, and over the years, there's been like a lot of new chains coming on board, like Solana and Luna and all these new uh, layer one chains that are kind of completely independent of, of Ethereum and Bitcoin. And uh, I've kind of largely ignored them for the purposes of this conversation. In fact, a lot of the stuff in the workshop will be just the baseline things, and I know all you guys are going to go and figure out lots of interesting things that are far more advanced than what I'm going to describe to you. But I want you to give a good like, foundation for your, for your um, ex explorations. OK, so now let's take a macroeconomic view of, of blockchain. I've got all of these transactions that are happening globally. 10,000 nodes across the world are, are simultaneously confirming all these transactions. What does that mean from a macro perspective? Well, on the left, I've got 
the central bank, right, which has one person, you know, like a, a board of governors that are defining what the role is, and that's on a country by country basis. So globally, I have this hodgepodge of central banks that are all trying to manage the economy. And on the right, I've got Bitcoin and Ethereum that are kind of just all across the world making transactions happen. So from that perspective, it's pretty cool to think about kind of where you can do transactions, but it's also uh, very scary if you're a central banker to be like, what is going on with all these currencies? Where are they going? There's no borders to any of these things. So I'm not, I'm not gonna opine on all the different crazy stuff that's going on, but I wanted you guys to just, just get a picture for that. And if you were the central banker saying, where's all this Bitcoin going to and coming from? I can't see you know, who, I don't know physically where any of these addresses are. They're all over the place. So sometimes central bankers get a little, a little upset and a little, little freaked out. But I just think it's a really cool technical feature. So, <clears throat> Okay, so that's kind of the quick macro discussion. Now let's talk about a financial discussion. And if you guys... If any of you guys are, have any finance background in the world of accounting, there's a ledger, the general ledger, which is like the foundational component of any accounting system. Um, and a ledger is very simply, you know, balance the, the debits and the credits, and you have to balance those all the way out. Every company has a ledger. Every country has a ledger. Uh, they often have lots of different ledgers. Um, but the biggest challenge in sort of old school accounting, I mean, you can even remember Ebenezer Scrooge, right, like trying to write and and uh, uh, what do you call it? Reconcile all of his all of his entries. Um, if you could synchronize ledgers and make sure that all the entries are valid and not have to go back and audit, wouldn't that be incredible from an accounting perspective? <laughs> and now, if I can synchronize ledgers all across the world at the same time using cryptographic proofs. That's freaking amazing. Like, that's awesome. When do I get my hands on that thing? And that's why sometimes you hear blockchain described as distributed ledger technology, because that's, in fact, exactly what it does. It's constantly synchronized. It's also immutable. It's timestamps, and it's, and it's decentralized, which, which I mentioned before, the private blockchains sometimes like to take that automatic synchronization and kind of bring it in-house, because that's a really nice feature, right? Um, turns out there's other ways to do that. But... That's like, you know, if you talk to CFOs, which I've done, and they understand what's going on with blockchain and Bitcoin, they're like, wait a minute, there's a distributed ledger and it's getting confirmed all the time and it's cryptographic secure and I don't have to go back and get my auditors to go and pile through all these transactions and figure out what was right and throw things out. I just can just confirm them. Um, it's amazing. And then you have this immutability factor and there's another component which is time stamped that I think gets overlooked a lot. So if you have an event or if you've done something on the blockchain and you do a transaction, that's locked in forever. All of those 10,000 nodes are going to keep it on their database for, forever. So you're always going to know what's, what's, you know th th that exists and that can be proven. And if you still have the keys to the wallet that did that transaction, you can prove that you did that. Or maybe if you stole the keys, I guess. Any questions on that? I don't know why. That's just like... You know, people that have like struggled with ledgers for their whole career, and then all of a sudden, like, wait a minute, you're doing this every 10 seconds, you're just confirming the everything, and it's all synchronized. That's amazing. Not too many finance geeks in the crowd, I guess, huh? <laughs> so, oh, I just gave it away. So, basically, when you put it all together, it becomes the operating system for the global economy, right? If you've got all these transactions, I can, I can have a wallet address on everything, I can write applications on top of it. And because this is MIT, I figured we couldn't limit ourselves to just this statement. We have to make it the galactic economy. We should be able to do transactions on Mars, right? We could throw a node up on the, on the moon or on the ISS, right, and have it you know, crunch some, some Ethereum and crunch some Bitcoin. Why not? So, um, so that's, that's, uh, that's kind of the, the, what I see um, blockchain doing eventually once we get over a lot of these humps and a lot of these challenges. There's a lot of you know, regulators that don't like it, and there's a lot of other issues, but I just see us plowing ahead because it's, it's sort of an unstoppable force at this point. Any questions on this before I change gears, move on? No? Okay. So um, I think I met, yeah, we, we talked about the, the sort of MIT experience, but I definitely love the men's at Manus aspect of it. So that's why I wanted to make all these workshops kind of hands-on um, and, and, you know, like mind and hand thinking and doing. 
theory and practice. So, I mean, I don't think there's any, any good class where you're not actually like accomplishing something at the end of it. So I, I want to get you guys, get your hands dirty and get you uh, b making wallets and, and interacting with websites and interacting with blockchains. So um, you do need a wallet in order to access kind of the blockchain itself. Um, most of the Web3 world runs on Ethereum. That's one of where the most of the developers are. No offense to the Bitcoin guys, but actually the Bitcoin Expo does have a lot of Ethereum stuff in it. Anyways, so we need to get a wallet. Um, but before we do that, I want to do a little cryptographic intermission here uh, and, and talk a little bit of math. So, I mean, I know you guys, most of you guys are MIT, so you probably understand all this math stuff. I'm used to teaching this class to MBAs, so I, I, I watch, walk softly on, on the math. Um, you need a private key which generates a public key, and, a, and a, the key to any of this cryptography is a one-way math function. How many of you guys know what a one-way math function is? Am I talking to, okay, 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 there's, there's not everybody. Okay, good, 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 okay. So a very simple example of a one-way math function is if I have two prime numbers and I multiply them together and I only give you the product, so I have x and y, they're two prime numbers, and I give you z, the product of them, and I say, okay, tell me what x and y is. Well, you know, to do prime factorization, you have to divide it by this number and divide it by the next one. But if, you, if they're two prime numbers, you have to actually get all the way to one of the prime numbers before you get the answer. So if I take a really, really, really big prime number, and then I multiply it by another really, really, really big prime number, and I give you the product of that, basically there's no computer on the planet that can solve that problem and then give you the private keys back. So as long as I hold on to X and Y, I have my private key, and then my public key becomes my address on, on the blockchain. So I can now have a public key that anybody can access and interface with, and I hold the keys to, to making sure that those are, that's my assets that are in the, in the public key. So that's, the, that's sort of the cornerstone of making sure we have the cryptography correct. So what we're going to do is we're going to generate private keys. And the way that Ethereum does it, by the way, my, my earlier background was in uh, pretty good privacy in RSA, which is sort of the original public key guys. Um, uh, and that was, the challenge in those days was getting people to understand what keys were and getting them to appreciate the private and public key concept. And we had to set up servers to send out keys and everything else. Crypto has solved all that now, so it's fantastic. And actually, they've taken it one step further, which is to make the private keys instead of like 10110011. Yeah, <laughs> they turned it into 12 words, which is fantastic. Um, so anytime you get a private key, you'll get 12 secret words, and the, the spelling and the sequence of them is very critical. And those 12 words turn into a private key, or, and then turn into a, a series, actually could turn into a series of private keys and turn into a series of, of public wallets. So I wanted to mention that now because we'll all do this in a second. Um, and basically what you're gonna see is, here are the 12 words, and don't do this. Like, don't show this to anybody. So, um, uh, let me see, I think. Any questions? Well, let me just take a look and see what we got here. Okay. So what I want to do is, if everybody has laptops, I want to I want to um, move into kind of having you guys create your own um, your own wallet. But first, let me just mention something about about wallets in general. Um, and we can actually maybe we can have you. Can you pass these around? Yeah. Um, so. There's a number of different types of wallets that are important for, for you guys to, to understand. Um, there's exchange wallets. So if I go to Coinbase, I can, get a, I can set up an a, a, um, account on Coinbase, which is a centralized exchange. And if I lose my keys, they can recover them for me, and I can call the 800 number, and that's fine. That's, that's fine. You can get a Coinbase account, but that's not what I wanted to talk to you guys about today. I want you guys to be in control of your own keys so that you're in control of your own wallet, so that you're in control of your own assets. And with that power comes responsibility, meaning you need to protect your keys, and you need to protect your, your, your keys on your own. So there's a number of different ways to do it, like hot and cold storage and all that kind of stuff. Um, but my favorite way to do it is with that three and a half, uh, that, that card that's being passed around right now. Um, you guys can just write down your 12-word secret phrase, fold it in half, and then store it away in a secret way. Now, if you take a picture of your secret phrase on your phone, does anybody know where, if I take a picture on my iPhone, where does that picture go? iCloud. iCloud. Who controls iCloud? Not you. That's all, that's all we know, right? So 
don't, if you really want to, so for, for purposes of right here, since we're in sort of a public setting, we could, this could just be a throwaway wallet. So you could just practice here and if, you know, if you really want to take a picture of it, but just recognize that it's not very safe, okay? Um, what you need to do is go back to your dorm room into a quiet place and then write down the keywords to keep it safe. Because today there's gonna to be zero assets in your wallet, but over time there could be a lot more assets on there. And, and the key to controlling those and proving that you own those is that private key. So that's why I like to make a point about writing it on a piece of paper. We understand physical security a lot better than we understand you know, cryptographic and cyberspace security. Um, and it's something that you can personally control. So a lot of the discussion about self-custody and self-sovereign and control around blockchain um, has to do with that aspect of it. So this is a very simple example, obviously, but very attainable, so, okay. So if you guys can all go to metamask.io, there's a ton of different wallets out there. I'm sure you guys will all find better wallets. MetaMask is the wallet that everybody uses, and it's not the greatest wallet. Sorry, MetaMask people, uh, but it's just the standard. It's kind of like the Microsoft Word of wallets. Like, it's not the best word processor, but everybody uses it, or Google, Google you know, Word. So if you guys can grab it, I want you to do something very slowly. Just get it and then write down the, those 12 words. And I have a video up here that's actually quite funny that I'll post later on. So if you guys wanna get your friends to get on, on the blockchain, then you can show them this video. Is there a question? Oh, no, only on laptop, sorry. You can try it on an iPhone, but I've never been able to successfully get it to work on iPhone. In fact, I've bothered the people at MetaMask to say, when are you gonna get a real mobile version of all this stuff? So, does everybody got what they're, you got what we're doing, no? Oh yeah, sure, sure. We can just pause for a minute for those watching online. What's that? Yes, yeah. You can download the browser extension from metabass.io on either Chrome or Firefox or, I don't know, Firefox or Brave or whatever is, whatever your browser of choice is. And then I just want you to, Spend a few minutes to write down those 12 words. This is important for the next phase of the class, so if you don't have a wallet, then we can't do the next thing, so. Yes, question? Could you explain a little bit more, like, why, like, how, like, in the past, the two pairs were, like, hard to set up, like, through the servers, like, how did um, so the example that I was thinking of previously where it was difficult was, the question is on, on keys and why was it difficult before. I think it, honestly it's just a user experience kind of maturity. Yes, MetaMask only supports Ethereum and EVM compatible wallets. Um, well, actually, you're getting ahead of me, but I'll, I'll get back to that because there's a bunch of other chains that it can connect to. But to answer your question on, uh, on keys, previously, there was a lot of time spent on the cryptography and not a lot of spent time spent on the user experience. So we assumed that everybody could just manage a big, long number and store it safely. Well, it turns out that writing that big long number down and missing a couple of characters is, it's critical that you get every single character correctly if you have like a 64 character, you know, hexadecimal code, right? If you miss one of those, then you've lost your keys. So what, the, what they've done over time is they've converted it to these 12 words, which is far more compatible with, you know, the English language and you can write down those words and know the spelling and know the sequence of them and that's what you need to know to create the private key. That was a big, a big improvement it's still a bit of a challenge, but um, that's that's pretty much the primary. <laughs> if you have assets in your wallet, then it would be bad. But if you have no assets in your wallet, then nobody cares. The, the other important point is there's tons of what's called phishing attacks. I'm sure you guys are well aware of phishing attacks. And they always say like, oh, I can solve your problem. Just sell me, send me your 12 words. You know, and, and, and just so you guys all know that that's like trigger for you know, and then everybody else has things that say like, we never ask for your seed phrase, never give away your seed phrase. And if you're reading the, um, the documentation on the MetaMask as you're setting it up, it does say like, never give away your, your I forget what they call it, secret, secret, secret recovery phrase. 
Wow, okay. It's a 12 word mnemonic, secret recovery phrase. Yes, sir. Ooh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, they're right up here in the wallet, in the wallet land. Um, uh, we don't trust them with our phrase. It should only be staying in the browser. Um, the, the other question is, why do we trust them to generate a phrase? And that's, that's a, still a question, because a lot of people, some attacks come from in the form of random number generation. And like figuring, you know, reverse engineering the random number that was used to create those 12 words and that that can be hacked. So if you really want to do it correctly, you would generate a random number in a true random fashion through a number of different means. And I forgot to bring my hexadecimal dice. Maybe next week I'll bring my hexadecimal dice and if you want to generate your own random number, you can roll them like 16 times and write down all the hexadecimal numbers and you can have your own private key. Um, but the, the, the truth is they are highly centralized and that's actually one of the concerns that a lot of people in the, in the blockchain space have is that MetaMask is one of the choke points for kind of access to this stuff. I mentioned there's a number of other wallets, but for the purposes of this class, I want to focus on MetaMask because it's easy and it's everybody knows it. But because it's getting more and more market share, it is getting centralized, right? So it is, it is a concern, but good question. Yes, ma'am. So along the same lines, um, you say it is stored only in the browser. Does that mean if you're using like Google Chrome, Google does have access to it? They shouldn't, but that's more of a browser question. I mean. Does Google have access to your cookies? Or does Google have access to your local storage in your browser? They're not supposed to, okay. <laughs> yes, sir. When you say like the private key has to be private. So eventually it does, well, so, so that's for the, the example that I was giving you was for factoring a prime number. Um, what Ethereum uses is, a, is elliptic curve, which is a different form of a one-way math function. So it, that's a totally different. It's like finite field calculations and yeah, yeah, so. Don't worry, it works well. It's been well beat up. That's the beauty of open source software. Any other questions? Does everybody have a wallet? Does, every, does anybody not have a wallet other than my iPhone user? Okay, good. So uh, one thing I'd like you to do, if you do have a wallet, if you can um, grab the address. So this is, this is Ethereum kind of in your browser. Sorry, I'm not going to do it live, but I assume you all have, you, all, you guys are all skilled at using uh, MetaMask in a browser, or using dropdowns from, from your browser window. There should be a little fox in the upper corner. But right in the middle here is your wallet address. So you can, you can pull down that and you'll, you should be able to get your, the wallet address that, that is your public key or your public address. Does everybody have that? Do you have that? Okay. <laughs> and is everybody in the WhatsApp group? Yes? So if you can copy your wallet address and paste it into the WhatsApp group, and then we can start sending transactions to each other. Come on, we gotta use the blockchain right now. What are we waiting for, right? Getting old standing up here. Might as well use the blockchain, let's go. I don't know if we have prizes for the first one to post to the, oh, we already got one, okay. Awesome. Downloading WhatsApp. Downloading WhatsApp. Oh dear. Uh, let's see. Can I send the QR code into the WhatsApp? If your neighbor isn't in the chat, can you help them get in by sharing them the code? Looks like a bunch of people are. So just, just to recap, this is your public key, so it's perfectly fine to send it out. It's a public key and it's also the address that you have right now on the Ethereum blockchain and a number of other chains. Okay. 
Oh wait, this is the. I think this is the QR code actually too. No, that's the that should be for the WhatsApp. I think I is it the same link that you sent me? Looks like everybody's getting a wallet in there. That's pretty good. Oh, yeah. Jumping ahead a little bit, but just wanted to put the QR code up. Okay. Um, so I wanted to describe to you guys uh, just some annoying aspects of MetaMask. Um, you got your wallets. I can tell by how many posts there, there were to uh, WhatsApp. Um, there was a question earlier about how many different chains are there. MetaMask allows you to connect to any what's called EVM compatible chain or an uh, Ethereum virtual machine chain. And it turns out there's a whole bunch of Ethereum virtual machine chains. What you have, that address you have in the private key gives you an address on virtually every one of those EVM compatible chains. So you can prove that you own that address on all those chains. Um, if you pull down this, this Ethereum mainnet, which I believe everyone's standard, there's some other chains that might show up, or you might get nothing. Um, and then you can also actually go over here and, and sele select this, which you can get different accounts for. So if you wanted to generate other wallet accounts, those are all tied to your same seed phrase. So if you're, if you're worried about security and you're going to add a lot of assets to your account, just throw this wallet away and don't use it. OK. Um, in order to uh, get more chains on your uh, MetaMask account, you can type them all in manually, or you can go to this chainlist.org website, which allows you to connect your wallet th through MetaMask and automatically add those chains that you want to. Um, the ones of interest that I find most useful are something called Gnosis Chain that was formerly known as XDAI, um, Polygon, which is a proof of stake chain that has a Matic token, and Binance. And there's like, I don't know, 100 other different EVM compatible chains um, that you can select from. And also, if you want to add tokens to your MetaMask wallet, you can go to tokenlists.org to add them. Yes, ma'am? So are you saying these are other blockchains? These are other blockchains, yes. These are other EVM-compatible blockchains so that MetaMask and your wallet is applicable on that chain. So all you have to do is change chains, and your wallet is still applicable on that chain. OK, so one thing you can all do is go to etherscan.io and take the address that you just used, and you can type it into the top area here, and it will show you presumably zero transactions since you just created the wallet on Etherscan. Um, the other thing you can do is if you go into that, and I can do it live here, you can just type in vitalik.eth, V-I-T-A-L-I-K dot E-T-H, 
which is Vitalik Buterin, who's the founder of Ethereum's um, wallet. And if you type that in and enter it, you can see, actually, let's, let's go ahead and do it. So let's just, let's just do it live here. Let's see if I, X going on. Does everybody else have faster ethernet connection than you? Okay, so right here I just type in vitalik.eth. And that will actually, that is, um, you guys are familiar with DNS, which goes from like google.com to an IP address. This is the same thing for Ethereum, where you can go from a name to a, to a number. Um, so if I search for vitalik.eth, it gives me this resolved address. So that's actually his wallet. And he has something like, what is that, $3 million worth of tokens in his wallet. And these are all the transactions that he's ever done on this wallet, shown further down. So I, I want you to appreciate what you're seeing here, which is, we happen to know this is Vitalik's wallet, but let's pretend like we didn't know that. This is an anonymous wallet that we can see all their transactions and their assets. So some people have described it as a transparent safe that has like an ID number on it, but I can see all the money flowing in and how, many, how much money is piled up in it and what kind of stock they have in it and what kind of trades they're doing and what the timing is of their trades and what other actions they're taking on their account and what the balance is in their account. So you can imagine, if anybody has a financial background or a trading background, you can imagine like how much salivation happens out there when people are like, I can watch these whale wallets and see what kind of trades they do and then just bat, you know, mirror all those trades. Fortunately, that's great, you can do that, but unfortunately it's already been played out quite a bit. Um, and there are a number of Twitter um, accounts that you can follow that are like whale watch and stuff, so when lots of money moves back and forth on chain, you, can, you get a notification of what's happening and then, I don't know, take action based on that. Um, but this is, you know, this is a very powerful aspect of blockchain where we have an a, a, a anonymous address, but we can see all the transactions. And some people, a lot of people complain about, you know, like like um, issues with with um, you know financial uh, problems with blockchain. But when you talk to people behind closed doors, they're like, we love blockchain because we can trace all these transactions. So we can, it's far better than dollars. We can see what's going on in all these things. So, so there's a lot of uh, sides to the argument about like, you know, where, where does blockchain sit and people who say things like, isn't that just for buying drugs and stuff? So, 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 so do dollars, right? Dollars are used to buy drugs as well. Um, yeah, so hopefully everybody's able to get your own address on there. It's probably not that exciting because there's no transactions on it. So what we need to do is get you guys a transaction or two. And can I ask, do any of my guys have a few pennies on the XDAI chain by any chance? Dang it, okay. <laughs> I can send you some. If you, could, if you can send them out to some of the other ones. Um, I can send you all the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, sorry, I, I should have. So, all the chains that we're talking about, um, they all have a gas cost, and you guys saw the the sort of the train of all of the the transactions happening, um, and they they require a certain amount of gas fees on mainnet or the main Ethereum network. Those gas fees can be very high. You know, fifty dollars to send a few dollars across the world is a little high, right? <laughs> if I'm only trying to send two bucks and it's gonna cost me 50 bucks, that's a little bit crazy. If I'm trying to spend five million bucks and it only costs me 50 bucks, that's a great deal. So um, unfortunately, it, it doesn't scale that way. But there are some other chains and the, the one that I wanna use for this class is Gnosis Chain, which is formerly called XDAI. Um, and that uses something called a proof of authority, which is basically like 12 nodes, this is not very decentralized, although they're getting decentralized, 12 nodes that just basically say, yes, these transactions are correct, yes, it's a lot faster, and it's a heck of a lot cheaper. The native token on the Gnosis chain is XDAI itself, which is a stable coin, so you can just have dollars, basically, that you're playing with, and each transaction costs about a thousandth of a cent, as opposed to, you know, 20 to 50 bucks on mainnet or so. So we should be able to do real transactions where you're moving real money, um, there are a whole host of what's called test nets. 
So you can, if you wanna just play around and, and use a testnet on your MetaMask account, your same wallet applies, um, and you can go to that chainlist.org and connect to a testnet, and then you can go to these things called faucets and get free Ethereum, free test Ethereum and, and move it around and practice using it. Um, I like to use XDAI because it has a little bit more of a real element to it. Um, it's real money, you can really convert it. Um, any other questions? I'm getting some glazed looks. Yes. Is the reason it costs so much on mainnet because you, those transaction fees have to pay for the proof of work? Like that's the. Like yes. The question is like, why is it so expensive? Yes, and also the primary reason, uh, let me think about this. A huge factor is simply the price of Ethereum. So I've been doing this since the price of Ethereum was like under $100. And so, you know, a transaction was a few bucks and it didn't seem too painful. But since it's denominated in Ethereum and the price of Ethereum went to $4,000, that same transaction all of a sudden went up by, you know, 40X. So that's probably the biggest factor of why it's so expensive. But on the XDAI chain, it's the, the, the currency is a stable coin, XDAI, which is a, a dollar stable coin. Um, it, 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 you know, it, it doesn't have the same level of decentralization, but it's great for, for our testing purposes. So hopefully Sam can send some XDAI to some of you guys. What you're gonna have to do is go to chain list and select the Gnosis chain from that list to add it to your MetaMask if it's not already. Um, and then you'll be able to go to um, the browser and, and look, uh, and you'll be able to see if you have a balance in XDAI um, on your MetaMask account. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. I should have told you this a while ago. So previously we used to send ETH around, but that got too expensive, so now we're sending XDAI around. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to send it to somebody else, you know, send a few pennies or something to somebody else in the class um, just to get the experience of doing it. Let me see here. So one of the questions that often comes up at this point is, okay, we have all this money that's on these blockchains, how do we get it off? And that's typically uh, uh, the way that you get money off of a blockchain is through um, an on-ramp or an off-ramp. So Coinbase is one example, um, but that represents kind of going from this global infrastructure to a local infrastructure where you need to get it denominated in your local currency. Um, there's a number of different players that are trying to move money across the world um, so that it can go up into it like the Ethereum. You can convert your dollars into Ethereum, move it anywhere you want, and then extract it wherever you need to. Um, but you have to interface with the local um, financing organizations at those, at those places. So um, it should be real money. I have no idea how Sam is getting XDAI into his account, but thank you, Sam. <laughs> I love it, I love it. Um, okay, so, hey, let's do a commercial break, shall we? Sorry. Um, so I, I wanted to get, tell you guys about Hashrat, and you guys can try this right now, actually. Now that you have MetaMask in your wallets, and, and you have no money in your wallet, luckily Hashrat is free. Um, what I'm trying to do with Hashrat is allow people to use this fantastic cryptographic infrastructure where you have, you know, I can send trillions of dollars between two wallet addresses, but I can't send a damn message. So I, I've been frustrated by this for the past several years and decided to put together a team to solve it. So we're doing just straight message, wallet to wallet messaging, um, using the same cryptography that's used to secure trillions of dollars. So I can, you can go to hash chat right now and we're in beta, so don't, don't, uh, don't hate me. Um, uh, but you can send me a DM and I, I will send you a, a PO app for the class. That is, uh, you can use mainnet for that. It, there's, no, there's no transaction fee. All you do is sign in and you, you send a message. So there's nothing that happens on chain for HashChat. We're just using the wallet infrastructure in order to send messages back and forth and they're end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, yes, ma'am. Than 
Signal does encrypt your information, but where is the signal endpoint? Does it go to your cell phone? I mean, when you sign up for Signal, can you be anybody, or do you have to have a cell phone to sign up for Signal? Or an email address. So the weak link in any communication chain is going to the cell phone, or going to the email, or going to Telegram. Um, Hashtag just goes right from your wallet to somebody else's wallet, and that's where it stops. And that's where you can confirm things. So using all of the tools of cryptography, like signing agreements and signing with your private keys, is exactly what we can do when you stop the messaging at the wallet end. There's a lot of messaging apps that can allow you to go on to email and move on to phones. We don't want to do any of that. We want to stop right where the, where the wallet is, because that's where the, the security and the, and the safety ends. So that's one of the biggest differences. We also have some interesting things planned around zero knowledge proofs, which I'll get into later on. Yes, ma'am. That is a really good question. I don't know. Don't lose your wallet keys. If there's one thing you take away from this class, don't use your key, lose your keys. <laughs> there you go. You got it. He's got it. No, that's a good question. And, and the, the, the private key is a, is a very difficult um, thing to manage. And that's one of the things that I think crypto is doing a great job of, is communicating to everybody about how how that needs to be done. So um, frankly, if you lose your private key, I think losing access to your messages should be the least of your worries. You know, losing your money and losing your funding would be a lot more of a concern, so. All right. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. If not, I can stop talking and you guys can just trade money back and forth. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I can't stop sending messages. Like, especially when I was in law school, I was sending messages like, every day. Like, oh, no. Yeah, same here. It's uh, yeah. not working. <laughs> I'll get on my devs. Don't worry. <laughs> Are you on a Mac or Windows? I'm on Mac. I'm on, I'm on Windows. I'm on Windows. It's not working for anybody. No, we don't have a mobile version yet, but we will, because chat needs to have mobile, so. Thank you, guys, for trying it out. I will send you a POAP if you just post. Actually, you know what? I think I can send a POAP to your, um, to your Ethereum addresses, right? Or no, you have your, in the WhatsApp account, I'll, I'll send it. Has anyone, has everyone seen the Bitcoin rap battle? Okay. Let me just play this for a second, and you guys can, where is it? Are you ready? So before I play this, um, this is something that was done a few years ago, but I love it because it's accurate and it's correct. And if you've already seen it, you should enjoy it a second time because it's, it's really well done. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we gather online as citizens of the world to judge two experts in a critical debate. In this corner, the creator of centralized banking Make some noise for Alexander Hamilton. And in this corner, the creator of the Bitcoin, the believer in the blockchain, give it up for Satoshi Nakamoto. Mr. Hamilton, you may begin. Before we begin, everyone do me a favor Thanks. and read a little thing I wrote called the Federalist Papers. Yeah. I explain how a nation's unlikely to survive without a strong central government to keep it alive. When I launched the central bank, Jefferson called me ill. Now you have my face to thank on every $10 bill. When America was cash-strapped, I pushed past that. Now some sicko makes crypto and our nation backtracks. Decentralized currency? Yes, I invented it. I'm sure many governments wish they had prevented it. The national cash is how they keep control. But freedom to the people was my all Ultimate goal. Am I a pseudonym? A group of men? It doesn't even matter. Nope. I invented Bitcoin because fiat is a disaster. A man from Japan or a damn hologram. I'm the reason open season on crypto began. Does anybody know what this crypto thing means? Nope. To me, sounds like the new get broke quick scheme. Yeah, a bunch of fools from across the land investing in something they don't even understand. Buying Litecoin cash, Bitcoin cash. It's all gonna crash and be gone in a flash. All this unsupported money is an irrational prank. And I'll be laughing all the way to my national bank. 
<laughs> yeah, dude, super funny. As if banks these days still help people make money. The rich get richer and we follow like we're all sheep. The banks serve Wall Street, crypto serves all streets. The interest in crypto's on rapid ascent. What's your current interest? Like half a percent? I'm sorry, the bank's gone past its peak. But I want info encrypted, not hacked and leaked. If this crypto system will be our salvation, it needs to be centralized, needs regulation. If our central database gets how you say hack, insurance will just make a case to get your money back. Cause in fact it's tracked and the money leaves a trail. Central currency is strong, cryptocurrency is frail. Untraceable money, wow, so clever. One typo in your address, now it's gone forever. It's frail, that's the essence of your lesson. Your money leaves a trail, yeah, a trail to a recession. A bunch of rich white guys made this system. Why would they ever change it when it made them rich men? Movie moguls fought hard against the VCR. Horse and buggy manufacturers all hated the car. So why would I take my advice from the banks? I don't need a bailout to survive. Thanks. The system is so broken. We need that crypto token. The system isn't broken. Can we trust crypto tokens? Testify! Fiat's the way a government controls the populace. Government protects its people. All of this is obvious. They keep the peace, and so they keep control. You want us ruled by crypto miners no one even knows? Oh, it's that strong central government bit again. They protect people, but only their citizens. Crypto has no borders. It's a true global currency and censorship resistance for those who need it urgently. Banks earn trust by assuming liability. You know a key, we know the customer explicitly. Will the real Satoshi please stand up? Nope, you'll still be hiding when crypto busts. You don't need to trust the people, you just need to trust the code. Yep. Every record's in the network, you just one node. Oh. And when you find a flaw, there's a software update. Now try updating cash. Go ahead, I'll wait. Bitch. Wait, cash works. You immediately pay. Crypto's a far worse medium of exchange. Can't Bitcoin the dentist? Nope. Can't Bitcoin my breakfast? Nope. Can't even use Bitcoin at Bitcoin conventions. Nope. No currency starts with universal adoption. Duh. It takes time for places to make it an option. Plus, billions of people don't have bank accounts. No savings, no interest, no checks to bounce. You're saving the world, but what's the price you're paying? The only change you're creating is climate change. Power grids spiking all across the land. Overheated, no one needs it, hope it all gets banned. From the king of paper currency, the hypocrisy. For bills and forms and triplicates, you're killing all the trees. Don't like my power usage? Stop targeting my rights. I own my purchase power, and the market sets the price. It's gonna get real dark if this is crypto's night. They use your currency for crimes, that's your kryptonite. Most crime is done with Benjamin. Not the blockchain. There's a reason most dollars carry traces of cocaine. Where's your proof of work? That's pure speculation. Yes. Those dark net black markets need more regulation. The world's full of currencies, and this one makes it worse. 180 now. Bitcoin's 180 first. It's not the currency itself. It's the method, man. You can't build things that last without a central plan. Crypto is a balance to the centralized model. Cause things fall apart. The sensor cannot hodl. If you end up having problems, I feel bad, bad for you, son. I've got 99 problems, but a bit ain't one. God. Hold on.